Hello, my name is Manpreet Singh, and I direct the Pediatric Mood Disorders Program in the Pediatric Emotion Resilience Lab at Stanford. I'm delighted to join you again for a follow-up on understanding and preventing depression in youth during and beyond the pandemic. What a year and a half it's been, and I'm glad to see the spotlight on mental health uh, in youth and uh, in individuals more broadly. I'm gonna provide you with a quick update on family risk factors and interventions, how we can integrate knowledge of signs of depression in a hybrid school environment, and recommend some primary and secondary prevention strategies to prevent the onset and delay of depression. We discussed about a year and a half ago why understanding adolescent depression during the pandemic is important. It just reiterates that uh, the global health burden of mood disorders is uh, not only now, but has been so even before the pandemic, and disability from symptoms frequently show up in schools. And, and we talked a little bit about how that happens. Since the initial presentation, we've um, really tried to drill down what exactly are, um, are the sources of distress for youth, how can we address them through school programs um, and well-being interventions, but also an acknowledgement of specific factors that might have been protective. For example, in China, youth seem to be very uh, positively um, uh, affected or experience less distress when they exercised and when they masked at school. So these factors might need to be considered as we continue to understand the impact of the pandemic on, on youth well-being. And of course, just getting back to our model of understanding the brain as the most genetically determined organ of the body and its susceptibility to a, a deep and rich uh, host of factors uh, that um, uh, are at play throughout the course of development, including um, not just adaptive mechanisms when confronted with stress, but also how that system responds to treatment and how it sticks to treatment when symptoms are likely to recur. So those are the themes that I wanna discuss with you today briefly. And just to remind us that the symptoms of depression haven't changed um, and it is helpful for any educator to be at least uh, appraised of what signs to look out for to be able to connect a student to a clinician and, and, and do some initial screening of symptoms, though a formal diagnosis still requires not just the presence of symptoms, but also episodes and recurrent episodes lasting at least two weeks or more. The assumptions that we make in the work that we do is um, include the following um, principles or um, uh, uh, I guess truisms. Um, the course of mood disorders are strongly affected by family contextual factors. Psychosocial interventions are vital um, and in, uh, essential in terms of the efforts to stabilize moods and reduce recurrence. And family interventions starting in childhood or adolescence are likely to improve the long-term trajectory, in fact, perhaps even prevent this, um, the development of lifelong mood disorders. How do we intervene? Well, most of us can be um, uh, appraised uh, quickly about the symptoms of mood disorders, but um, education may or may not be uh, sufficient in and of itself. So in the field of psychiatry and psychology, we do a lot of behavioral skills training in addition to psychoeducation. We add communication skills and problem solving and combining those three elements um, in the family context can be conceptualized as family-focused therapy. So how does family-focused therapy with all three components compare to just psychoeducation um, alone? Well, in our work um, in youth with and at risk for bipolar disorder, led by Dr. David Miklowitz at UCLA, we've discovered a number of um, findings, including the fact that there are a number of critical comments that can be measured and assessed in a family context, hostility, as well as emotional over-involvement that leads to high expressed emotions that can often lead to maladaptive ways of interacting in a family system. 
This can lead to recurrence of mood symptoms and um, frequent relapses. So the idea of intervening and the family systems system becomes very important for families that are ex particularly experiencing high expressed emotions. And what we've also found is that even kids who are healthy, who don't have any mood symptoms exposed to family conflict and chaotic family environments, have reduced connectivities in their brains, um, particularly in regions important for regulating rewards and emotions, and that th that disconnectivity can lead to or predict the eventuality of decreased pro-social skills, the capacity to make and sustain relationships, as well as mood and anxiety problems down the line. And in our randomized controlled trial I described to you uh, last year, where we compared family-focused therapy to psychoeducation alone, we did see the effect or impact of family-focused therapy in reducing the recurrence of depressive episodes in youth at risk for bipolar disorder, which we were very delighted to discover. And um, the key ingredients that seem to be critical, particularly in family-focused therapy, seem to relate to <clears throat> the impact of self-monitoring, the family-focused, uh, aspect or element of the treatment, and for symptom uh, improvement, cognitive restructuring, maintaining daily rhythms, and the communication training ended up being key elements. So what we think family-focused therapy is doing is it's improving motion regulation, targeting expressed emotion, in the, particularly in the parents, improving the quality of the family relationships and physical well-being, as well as pro-social behaviors, and perhaps having an interactive effect with medications. The other uh, intriguing finding that I su uh, suggested to you last year um, is that um, perhaps family-focused therapy does have a potential to impact the brain to, towards more improving connectivities between regions that regulate emotions and those that express them. The other uh, finding that we, we uh, published earlier this year was that family-focused therapy also has um, an effect on reducing suicidal ideation, and that's through um, a reduction in family conflict. Appreciating that there are mediating effects of the youth's perception of family conflict on the association between whether they got family-focused therapy or just psychoeducation alone has um, clear implications for suicide prevention. Digital therapeutics are other area that we've worked on um, considering, and both for the from the uh, perspective of offering youth immediate access to uh, tools that they can use that are implemented in these um, psychosocial interventions, but also uh, to uh, increase and inspire broad scale, wide scale dissemination. So. Though we know that anxiety and depression run together, it's very important to appreciate that the diagnosis can potentially be challenging and that referrals um, are potentially impacted by workforce shortages that remain um, and are even more um, uh, compromised uh, post-pandemic. So working together to find strategies on how to cultivate resilience and adaptation to stress becomes even more important. I'd like to acknowledge our village and thank you for your time and attention today and look very much forward to our future um, discussions on this topic and others. Thank you.